Well, good morning, Lindsley Avenue. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. I'm glad, I know we all are, that it's not 10 degrees outside and that we're not as concerned about slip sliding away or any of that. Before we get started with the lesson, a couple of things. First, we have these little magnets that we've had for a couple of weeks. This has our 2024 theme or resolution on it. Uh, the theme or resolution is from Hebrews 13, 6, which says, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. I know a number of you already have them, but if you don't have one of these and want one, Brett, I'm going to call on you as a thing. Would you come get these and just give them to anybody that doesn't have one that wants it? Just right now. Yeah, come on. Come on now. Uh, so if you don't have one of these and want one, raise your hand. We've got plenty of them. So just go ahead and pop it up if you want one. Not I knew nobody wanted one, so that's why I went out kidding. And uh, Jeff, Robbie, let's make sure we carry a nice stack to Knowles. I don't think we've ever given them out yet to Knowles. To those of you at Knowles, thank you for uh, joining us here a little later this afternoon. The other thing we're starting, uh, Jeff mentioned it, is on the back of the pew, pretty much where everybody's sitting. We tend to sit in roughly the same place. There are some index cards that are blank, right? We're going to try to start this uh, every, every week. You know, when the sermon is over, we have a song that we call an invitation song. And the idea of that is, is that if you are thinking about where your relationship is with God and after the sermon, you think, well, I really need to get in a better place with God. It's come on down. It really is at that point. And... We can either go to prayer to God for you and with you and for ourselves, either asking for forgiveness or asking that we just do a better job of living for God. But a lot of times, people really don't want to get up. Everybody will look at me. Well, come on, it's just us. But everybody will look at me. So what we've tried to do is, if you have a specific prayer request, there should be a tiny little pen, pencil rather, about three inches long. Write it out on the card. During the service, is fine, right? We've got some extra cards here that Brett's holding up. Write it out, and then when we have the Lord's Supper and collection, these little, what do you call those things? Wicker baskets? Wicker, I haven't used that word in forever. When those come by, drop the card in there. It doesn't matter, I mean, it could be anything, and uh, I will get those at the very end, and then we'll have a prayer where we have any prayer requests, we will take those to God before we leave, okay? It's perfectly fine to come down during the invitation song, and we'll have a prayer specifically for you, but if we don't have any cards, not a big deal. We want to have the opportunity, if something's on your mind or heart, if you want us to pray with you and for you, we're going to start doing that. And I would say the same thing applies to those of you at Knowles. We can collect a card or have a prayer request. We can always do that here the next week, if you would like, or we can do it at Knowles directly. We're out there. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, thank, well, thanks to Mark for leading uh, the songs. Uh, I always enjoy the, this little light of mine or this little Christian light of mine. And that leads directly into the picture on the screen here where we're going to talk about the Christian life. We're going through some things that Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke. And this morning we're in Luke chapter 8. Next week we're going to be, as I recall, in Luke chapter 11. We're in Luke chapter 8 this morning, and I hope we can get some things out of the verse that Howell read earlier. It's going to help us think better about where we are and where we ought to be. So in Luke 8, 16 through 17, Jesus says some pretty important things that we really should keep in mind. Let's start with the first one that's in verse 16 that Howell read to us. Jesus says, no one lights a lamp and covers it with a bowl and puts it under a bed. I mean, what is the point of that, right? Instead, the light is put, the lamp is put on the lampstand so people will see the light as they come in. This may be something we all sang as a child. Uh, I think, I know I did. It's one of the first ones I ever remember singing. And it's a good song to sing as an adult because our responsibility, our goal of having our light be seen by others doesn't go away when we suddenly become a teenager. But what does it mean? What's Jesus really trying to tell us here in verse 16? Well, in nearly every one of us, there's this instinctive fear of being different, right? Growing up tends to teach us that those who are uh, 
different or unique or stand out or isolated or worse. That was one of the worst things that happened to you if you were in elementary school or uh, going through high school. You know, uh, your mom puts you in a shirt with red flowers on it or something. You go to school and you come home with red marks on your head because the people at school were trying to teach you a lesson. You don't want to stand out. You don't want to be different. Well, we all want to fit in. We do. And we really don't want to be like that. Now, that's that picture from the Christmas story. And that's Ralphie in the pajamas that his grandmother or aunt or somebody, I don't remember who it was, sent to him. Imagine showing up at a sleepover wearing those. You think there's going to be any abuse? There shouldn't be, right? That's part of living the Christian life. There shouldn't be, but it's really hard to hold back sometimes when that happens. In the movie Home Alone, um, Kevin relates a story that when somebody got, a, there was a rumor about somebody that they had dinosaur pajamas. And he makes the remark, a kid can get beat up for that. We tend to have this pressure put upon us to not be different, to blend in, to go along, right? To go along. Nobody wants to be at school this way. I tell you, it doesn't go away when we become adults. I think the word lampshade here, when we're thinking about this, no one puts it under a bowl or put it on the uh, uh, lampshade over it. Nobody does that. It's because the lampshade, of all things, is really designed to hide part of the light. In reality, it's, it's much more if you have a really bright light, you want something over it to block seeing the light bulb or seeing the source of the light, but the light is still reflected up and down to give light to the room. But is Jesus really talking about lamps here? Is he giving home decorating tips? You know, how to efficiently uh, cast, uh, have the candle power, if you will, uh, lumens scattered throughout the room probably. That's not what he's talking about. He's not. So what does he mean? Well, look at John 8, 12. We read this during class today. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The light the world needs comes from Jesus. Whoever follows me will have the light of life and never walk in darkness. So if we follow Jesus, we are to be the light of the world. And the world hates the light. I think we got to be prepared for that. People don't like the, the, the light, right? People love the darkness, in part because we tend to think that in the darkness, nobody's going to see what we're doing. No one's going to know what we're up to, so we can hide it better, right? We can hide it better. But with, if we are walking around with simply the light of Jesus showing in our hearts and in how we live, hopefully it's not quite as bad as those pink bunny pajamas. But by kind of by definition, you're going to be different. You need to be prepared for that. You need to be prepared for that. The light of Jesus in me. What does that mean? What, does it, what do I mean when I say the light of Jesus in me? Jesus is the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As that light is within me, as I live differently from those around me. Look like what it means. If I have the light of Jesus in me, if I'm following Jesus, I'm going to try my best to live my life the way Jesus wants me to, and that may not be the way somebody next to me, somebody that I work with, somebody that I uh, hang out with, makes their choices and sees how their life's going to play out. Because the light of Jesus may not be within them. There's, there's bound to be, there really ought to be a difference if the light of Jesus is within me. Now that can often lead to persecution. If you're living your life differently than those around you, sometimes you get abuse heaped on you. Somebody might say that that's a pretty holier-than-thou attitude, or you're being dogmatic, or you're simply self-righteous. Well, but that's really not it at all. It shouldn't be. If you look at yourself and how you're interacting with people and there's some truth in there, that's, that's different. You shouldn't be doing that. We should simply be living the way God wants us to, 
having our choices be the kind of things Jesus would want us to be making those choices and it should be different but sometimes this abuse is deserved sometimes it's not if we are living our life with the light of Jesus within our hearts sin's going to be exposed by contrast by contrast to the choices you and I make or at least it should be when my life is compared to the life of somebody who does not have the light of Jesus living within them. Right? Somebody singing, you know, this little devil light of mine, right? I'm going to let it shine. And someone singing this little Christian light of mine, surely 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10, 11, noon, all through the day, what did the two people do? There should be some differences. You would think either that or the person who says they're serving the devil is not, or the person who says they're following Jesus is not. Well, again, what does it mean? The light of Jesus living within me will require me to be different compared to people around me. I won't be joking the way other people do. I won't be engaging in behaviors that are sinful the way other people do. I won't be uncaring about people in need, people who are hurt. We must be different because if the light of Jesus is living within us, we are different. And if I'm not different, it may mean that maybe the light of Jesus isn't living within me the way it should. And I really suspect that's probably a pretty uncomfortable place to be. You know, hey, come on, we're all going out to the bar after work. They've got a special, right? It's ten for the price of one. That sounds like a bargain. Right? Ten for the price of one, that certainly sounds like a bargain. If the light of Jesus is living within me, right? Do I go and have ten for the price of one the way everybody? No, no, thank you, thank you. Uh, not sure that's the place I need to be going. You gotta be careful, right? Because you can get real appearing to be self-righteous. That's a sinful place to be. And you know, I mean, you, the life needs to be different. Sin needs to be pointed out, but be careful or else you won't have any way to influence anyone. You certainly shouldn't be there hollering for the next mug to be brought out. Not living any differently at all than people around. Hope that makes sense. That's the basic part of people seeing the light as they come in. As people come in close to my life, the light of the world living within me should put light out into the world and reflect off of the people I encounter. They should see it. They should be able to notice it without being in their face without being holier than thou or anything like that. Then look at verse 17. Jesus says, whatever is hidden away will be brought out into the open. Whatever is covered up will be found and brought to light. I want you to think about that for a minute. Sometimes we try to hide things from ourselves. We got a problem and we try to ignore it. Right? We shut our eyes to the consequences of certain actions and habits. Drinking too much and wake up the next day and you're like, oh, right? Barely slither out of bed and slide to the floor. Or gambling too much and you're like, I'm short of money at the end. I mean, there's all sorts of things from an immoral perspective, right? And there are consequences from those choices if we're making poor choices and we're aware of them, but we try not to look too closely at our choices. It's like someone deliberately ignoring the symptoms of an illness that's becoming evident. Yeah, I've got this open sore on my arm, and boy, it's three times bigger than it was last week, but I'll just put a shirt over it. Ignoring consequences, ignoring the signs of things that are not going the way they should, trying to hide something from ourselves. What foolishness that is. If you're having a medical problem, go see a doctor. If you're seeing consequences of your choices, see the great physician. 
see Jesus and begin changing your life. Get the medicine that you need. The doctor will have his or her medicine. Jesus has a medicine to bring his light into our life. You can't hide things from yourself. It does not work. You can do it for a little while, but it's not going to work. It's just not. We do it a lot anyway. Very common thing. Most of us do it, have done it at some time or another. No show of hands here, but I'm sure most of us have done this, trying to hide things from ourselves. Sometimes we try to hide things from others too, right? The problem is, things have a way of coming out. You know, suppose again, I was having a problem with my arm. Uh, pull that shirt sleeve down, cover it up. You don't think my wife would eventually notice it's 130 degrees outside. Why are you wearing this sweater? Why don't you ever bend your arm anymore? I just like holding my arm out straight. I don't want her to know. Is that going to work? No. It's not going to work. The one with a secret is fairly unhappy. Certainly a secret trying to hide. It's one thing if you got a secret because there's a party coming. You know, I'm not talking about those kind of secrets. You're trying to hide something from somebody else who's going to be pretty unhappy. It's hard not to. On the other hand, the person with nothing to hide at least isn't worrying about something. They're going to be happy. An architect, old, old, old story, 2,500 years old or so, an architect offered to build a house for Plato, that Greek philosopher. Right? Greek philosopher. Much of what we have is our way of thinking. Western societies came from this period back in ancient Greece. Built a house for Plato where nobody could see into any room. I guess there's, there's no windows. All the rooms would have complete privacy. Plato said, I'll give you twice the money if you build me a house where all can see into every room. If you're thinking about it, what he's saying is, if I'm living my life consistently the way his philosophy was trying to suggest, I won't have anything to hide. So a very person that can speak like that, a person that can think like that, should be very happy. You know, sometimes this happens when people are running for office. They'll get pretty far down the line of running for office, and then it comes out some big whopper of a problem. Like, how on earth did they ever think people wouldn't hear about? can't hide things from yourself, can't hide things from others you can. Sometimes, perhaps the most foolish thing of all, people try to hide things from God. Why do we think we can hide things from God? If I don't ever talk about it, God won't know. You need to figure out what your definition of God is, if that comes to mind. The God that created the universe, spoke the world into existence, is going to know what we've been up to. Can't hide it from God. Oh, we might be able to hide things from others for a while, right? Back to my arm here. Maybe my wife won't notice that I've got a long sleeve shirt on for a few days. I might be able to do it for a while. I might be able to even hide something from myself for a while, but you can't hide things from God. But the other idea, along with verse 16, talking about putting the light on the lampstand, that whatever's hidden will be uh, brought to light, eventually someone who is speaking things that don't match what God wants, speaking false things, speaking doctrines and teachings that don't match, God says it's okay if you beat up people. Or God says it's okay if you drink gamble and sleep with whoever you mean, whatever you're, we're talking about, right? Eventually those things are going to get brought out into the light and seen for what they are. I think the primary thing Jesus is talking about is us and our choices and hiding the things, but the light of Jesus' teaching, the light of life is going to expose all things. All things. So look, conclude today, it'll be a little shorter. We're either moving forward or we're moving back. You can't stand still in life. It's as if we're on this conveyor belt, and we are, right? 
as a kid, right? I know I did this. You ever tried to go up the wrong way on an escalator? That's always fun. The thing's trying to make you go down and you're running it up, hoping a security guard doesn't see you. If you stand still on the elevator, what happens? You're not still, right? The es escalator, not elevator. The escalator's moving and so it puts us moving along with it. You've got to really hustle to go against that grain. Well, in our lives, we're either moving forward or moving back. God expects us to shine our lights, show our lights, show Jesus living within us, not hide it, not put it under a bushel. God expects us to be different. Do people know that you follow Jesus by the choices that you've been making? Do they know it about me? At work, am I the one with the best off-color joke? Boy, like, listen to this one. If I come out with stuff like that, are they going to think, well, I'm sure he's a minister. Let's hope not. Otherwise, I don't know what ministers they've been reading, right? But it should be the same for all of us. We need to be the kind of person God expects us to be. And it is to be different light of the world, to help people see Jesus living in us so they can hopefully see what Jesus living in them will mean. So my question this morning is this, is the light of the world, Jesus, shining in your life this morning? Is it? Only you can really answer that question. If he's not, this is your opportunity to come back home to God and say, Father, I, am not been, I have not been living the way I should be. And either ask for forgiveness or ask for prayer to be stronger, to be the kind of person God wants you to be. But you can't do that if you're not a member of his family, if you're not already a follower of Jesus, a Christian, which is what that's called. And to become a member of his family, you've got to understand who Jesus was, who he is, what he did. He died to pay the price for my choices so that I, by changing my life from wrong to right, and as Jesus commanded, being immersed in water so that he would be raised up and be forgiven. That's how I become a member of his family. If you're not a member of his family, that's the very first step. This is your opportunity. Please don't leave here this morning without coming home to God as we stand and sing.